But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, in the year 2003, I was between jobs. And unknowingly, I was slowly being called into ministry, but I didn't know that at the time. And I was working at a place called Chappie's Deli in Southside, Birmingham, as a waiter. And that was a very formative experience for me. And I had the experience that a lot of wait staff do. A man was out of drink. He had drunk all of the Coke or Sprite or whatever it was. He caught my eye, he raised his cup, and he shook his cup. The ice devoid of Coke or Sprite or whatever it was that he was drinking with a condescending, irritated, and put out air. And with murderous thoughts, with fantasies of pouring the drink on his head, I went over there and dutifully filled up his dang cup. I've told the story a few times because I've thought an awful lot about it. In many contexts I've thought about it, not the least of which is theological. And as I read the New Testament reading appointed for this morning in morning prayer, Romans 6, verses 12 through 18, the story came back to me. In Romans 1 through 5, Paul is discussing the universally sinful human condition, the condition that cannot break out of the bondage in which it finds itself because of the fallen, because of the fallenness, because of the fall, because of Adam and Eve's fall. The condition that needs a word from outside, the condition that needs power from outside to liberate it in some way, and the condition that gets that in Christ's work, in the gospel preached that is the power of God. After all this, Paul writes in Romans 6 of a new Christian state of being. It can even be seen, and Paul describes it, as two ages existing in the same chronological period. Verse 14 of chapter 6, Paul writes this, For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. These are two states of being that exist in one chronological period of time, given the different people, given different persons and their status before God. You know, it can, it can exist with, 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 with one person in, in, in one pew, another person in another pew. It can, and it can exist, uh, uh, there can be different states of being in, in households, different states of being in businesses. The interesting thing is that the slavery analogy is used extensively, complete with a master. And the surprising thing is that those belonging to the Christian state, to, 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 to the state of being that Paul talks about as being under grace, um, that person is referred to as one, free, as both free, and a slave with a master. How can you be both free and a slave with a master? How can these be true at the same time? To understand how this is the case is to truly understand what Christian freedom is. And in order to understand, let's go back to the man at Chappie's Deli in 2003 in Southside, Birmingham, Alabama. He probably had something in his life that led him to believe that he had a lot of leverage in life and that he deserved in a way to be served in a hop to it sort of way. That is to say, he had a very common human understanding of what freedom meant or what freedom means. And this is what the common human understanding of freedom is. If I build up enough leverage in life, 
I will be free. If I have enough center of gravity, I will be free. And you hear it constantly in ads. Do you want financial freedom? Do you want freedom from worry? The common idea of freedom. And it wouldn't, these ads, they wouldn't be there if they were not effective. So we're talking about something very, very primal within the human condition, the human concept of freedom. If I have enough leverage, I will be free. That is called autonomy. Autonomy. If I have autonomy, then by definition, I am free. Being a law unto oneself, which is what the etymology of autonomy means, if I am a law unto myself, in a sense, I can define reality. Now, I follow football recruiting to my great shame. I have not grown out of this yet. And I'm beginning to hear recruits say something new, something that I haven't heard before. XYZ program, be it Texas or Texas A&M or Clemson or Alabama or Tennessee, this program will help me build my personal brand. I've not heard that before. And then the programs are saying, yes, we will help you build your personal brand. But what happens when your brand is built? And that's, that's where, what are we looking toward when we're thinking about personal brand? And you know, you have your own personal brand. And it, it all has to do with having enough leverage to be free, or in, in your mind free, in my mind free. What does that mean? Pro careers, money, leverage. And if I have that, I have freedom. That's autonomy. The ability to define your reality. The ability to define and to demand things on your terms. The man at Chappie's understanding was that leverage does not just get service, it gets subservience. And that's where all of this goes. The human idea of freedom, the human idea of leverage is to be served. Autonomy is a form of self-centeredness, which is the very essence of sin. Paul calls it, people who are looking for human freedom in that way, people who are looking for leverage, people are looking for the human freedom that comes from what they believe leverage will provide. He calls that being a slave to sin. And he calls that being in the age of law a bondage to sin. And what Paul says, and what the Bible says, is that that understanding of human freedom is the opposite of true freedom. One working towards autonomy is burying herself deeper into bondage. Now we've all suffered under this, and we haven't had the category to understand why am I not happy? Why am I not fulfilled? Why is there this aching void in my being? I'm trying my hardest. I'm trying to, to pursue the things I need to pursue. I'm trying to gain all the leverage and the freedom that I possibly can. Why do I have this aching void in my soul? In my soul? Well, if autonomy isn't freedom, then what is? <clears throat> First of all, we need to fundamentally alter, fundamentally and categorically alter what we understand as freedom. Christian freedom is completely different from what we see as freedom, that idea of leverage and human freedom. And Paul helps us understand this in 1 Corinthians 9.19. And he says it here. For though I am free from all, he's talking as a Christian, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. Our Lord Jesus Christ himself, in Mark 9, 35. And he sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, If anyone would be first, 
he must be last of all and servant of all. Martin Luther paraphrased this in his wonderful treatise, The Freedom of the Christian, which is available on the internet for free. I recommend that you read it. You can read it. You don't, it, it's, it's, it's not going to be too difficult for you to understand, and it will, it will change your life if you read this treatise. And I'm not exaggerating. But his thesis is this. A Christian is a perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. A Christian is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject of all, subject to all. How can these things work together? What is meant by free from all and Lord of all? Simply this, by the grace of God, as a sheer gift through no leverage of our own, we are heirs of the King through no leverage of our own, heirs of a king, and not just a king, the Lord of creation. We are heirs to the Lord of creation in Christ. This unconditional adoption comes to us through the gospel, which is the power of God. The gospel preached the power of God. We become adopted by the Lord of creation himself. There can be no higher position that you can attain on your own. None. Not even close. There can be higher, no higher expectation than being heirs of all. No expectation can be higher. All the leverage in the world is there. Nothing is lacking in Christ. And yet, the family resemblance of God the family resemblance of, of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one of self-giving, of giving oneself to the nth degree, one of being a servant of all, to shift one's love from self to God and others. We are Lord of all and subject to all. This is true freedom. This is Christian freedom. To be both adopted Lord of all and to empty oneself in love and service to all. That is the freedom of faith. It is the freedom of hope and the freedom of love. It is the freedom that builds others up. And in doing that, it builds you up. It is what we are created for. To, to, to be truly free in the Christian sense is to be truly human. It is to be truly fulfilled. In verses 17 through 18 of chapter 6, Paul says this, and I started off with it. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin, that is, people who sought leverage, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Heirs of a king, slaves to righteousness. That is true freedom. The slavery goes from one master, which is sin, to another, which is God. And service goes from self-destructive to self-ennobling. Christian freedom is the movement from bondage to self to bondage to God. And in bondage to God, we are truly free truly human, truly blessed. My prayer for you, as it is for me, is that may we be bound to God through Christ, through the gospel, so that we may become free. Amen.